Hi. Hi. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. My name is Marty Mascari. I'm with the North Central Texas Area Agency on Aging and the North Central Texas Aging and Disability Resource Center. Both are under the umbrella of the North Central Texas Council of Governments. Once again, we are very, very blessed to have our partners at the James L. West Center for Dementia Care in Fort Worth, Texas, to present today on dementia versus depression. But before we get started, we're going to go over the CEU requirements for those of you that are on for CEU. So I'm going to let Jamie talk about CEUs. Well, we are happy to provide CE credits for the programs that we um, get to do with Marty and the um, Area Agency on Aging. For this particular program, we are offering one and a half CE credits um, for licensed social work, nursing, and LPCs for those in the state of Texas. We can also offer a certificate of attendance as well. You will receive a follow-up email. In that email, there will be a survey monkey link. To get your CE credits, you must complete that Survey Monkey evaluation. So click the link. It takes maybe one or two minutes to complete the evaluation. Um, and then allow us about three to four weeks for us to process all the CE um, certificates and get those sent out to you by your email. Um, the link and evaluation will close in seven days. So the, um, the end of the day on October 4th will be your last chance to get CE credits for this program. Great. In, in addition to, um, to CEUs, which just, I want to make sure it's very clear, the Survey Monkey is required if you want CEUs. You've got to do the Survey Monkey evaluation. Um, we would also like for you to do it. I know, I know um, just like we need information for our funding sources, so do Jamie and Holly. So if you would fill out the Survey Monkey, even if you don't want um, CEUs, I think that's very helpful. In addition to that, we have to the Area Agency on Aging, a Google survey that pops up, should pop up as you um, log out today. Um, we ask you to do that as well. And um, that is our um, feedback for our funding sources on the objectives we set forth when we applied for funding. So that should pop up in the email, I mean, as you log out today, but the link for that will also be in the, um, in the follow-up email. But once again, Please note that you've got to fill out the Survey Monkey um, if you if you are looking to get CEUs because the Google survey will not trigger your CEUs uh, for this. Okay, that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Holly and Jamie and let them talk about dementia versus depression. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You want me to talk about this, Holly? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I will just let you know real quick, um, as Marty mentioned, we're um, more than happy to partner with the North Texas, um, North Central Texas Area Agency on Aging. But here at the James L. West Center, um, we serve persons impacted by dementia. So whether it's the person with a diagnosis, their family member, their friend, their neighbor, their professional that's taking care of them. Um, and we do that in a variety of ways. We do have a long-term care residential community here in Fort Worth, Texas, where um, we do long-term stay. We can also do respite stay for a short period of time, you know, five nights to 30 nights. We have our day program as well. So you can come just during the day, get the same fantastic activities and programs and social um, connections and nutrition and everything, but then get to go home at night. And um, we are... Um, uh, waiting to be certified to get our short-term rehab. So as soon as um, they come out and license us, then we will also be able to provide short-term rehab. Um, and we will focus um, on our expertise, those living with dementia. And of course, we do have our education that we are um, being a nonprofit. This is our charitable gift back to the community. And um, so we are more than happy that y'all are taking advantage of some of the education that we provide. And I will turn it over to Holly. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. So today we're going to talk about depression versus dementia, and we're going to talk about the signs and symptoms of depression and dementia, how to receive an accurate diagnosis, and then how to treat each of them. There's my information for those of you who are getting your CEs, our course outline, and our educational objectives for those of you like me who have to collect those uh, CEs because we are licensed. Let's jump right in, though, and talk about depression. Most of the time, when you think about depression, I want you to just kind of think to yourself, what symptoms comes to mind? 
or what's the first thing that you think of if somebody were to say, I'm depressed, they are depressed. Think about the symptom that might come to mind. And if you would, put that in the chat. We'll see what starts coming up here. What kind of things start coming up? When you hear somebody is depressed, what do you think of? Sad, lack of motivation, sadness, absolutely. Low mood, lonely, lethargic, not eating, good. Hopeless, sleepy, lack of interest. Lots and lots and lots of people putting sad. A person can get diagnosed with clinical depression and not be sad. Just like a person can get diagnosed with a dementia and not have any memory loss. We'll talk about that more when we get to dementia. It's one of those things that it could be part of it. And with dementia, it's coming. It will come. But there's a couple of different types of dementias that can present with no memory loss. Well, depression can present with no sadness. When we look at the definitions of depression, there's actually over 20 different common symptoms for depression. It is a medical illness that negatively affects how you feel, the way you think, and how you act. Notice I've got medical in bold terms there. Now, some of you used words like despondent, hopeless, dejection. It can happen at any age. It's often in adults. Now, I also want you to think about this. It has little to do with what's happening around you. It could be triggered by what's happening around you. But you could have a fantastic, wonderful home life. You could have the most loving friends. You could have your dream job. You could have the life that other people are envious. They just envy you and you're depressed. What if instead of calling depression a mental illness, we started talking about it as a medical illness? Or what if we talked about it as brain health? Wouldn't that change the stigma? Those of us who work in the world of counseling. We don't like using the term mental illness because there is that stigma with it. It's medical. It's a medical illness. And it's time that we be able to talk about it without there being any type of shame. Let's start looking at some of the signs and symptoms of depression. And there's going to be two slides here. I've got them labeled number one and number two. When you get copies of this, I would encourage you to take your highlighter, go through these, and any of them that you felt in the last couple of weeks, the last two weeks, to highlight that. Because depression affects different people in different ways. Sometimes the symptoms can last for a couple of weeks, but sometimes they can last for years, months. Now, rather than using the word sad, many time a person with de depression will say something like, I feel empty. It's nothing. There's just nothing. So that might be the term that we use or a client or a friend or a family member uses. Now, some of you listed many of these that are on here. But there may be a few that you look at and go, wait a minute, I didn't realize that was a sign of depression. Because look, it can be an increase or a decrease in sleep. We're sleeping more or we're not sleeping much at all. Having thoughts of death or self-harm or suicide or why the world would just be better off without me. being anxious or worried many times about the future. Those feelings of hopelessness, being irritable, and can even have hallucinations and delusions. 
here's the second set that many times we don't realize go with depression. What about rage? Somebody who is angry all the time. Now let's talk about why in the world does that fall under depression? Anger, when you study feelings and emotions, for most people, anger is the easiest emotion or feeling to have. Because I feel like I'm in control when I am angry. And I can at least get my way with this when I'm angry and I'm loud or I'm throwing something or I've got fist. Because the rest of my world is out of control. And when we get right to the root of anger, it is almost always fear-based. Another thing that we will see in a person who is depressed is digestive problems, irritable bowel syndrome. Think about why that's happening. If we're living in that constant state of fight, flight, freeze, fawn, we're dumping cortisol. And when we dump that cortisol, our digestive system stops because our body's getting ready to fight, flight. It's getting ready. And so we stop. The digestive system stops having aches and pains all over our body without a cause. But if we're sitting around with our shoulders pulled up or pulled in because we're tense all the time, it can feel like we've really worked out and we haven't done anything. Having no pleasure watching or doing activities that have brought us pleasure before or feeling restless. Now let's look at depression in older adults. And this is from the Mayo Clinic. And please hear this. Depression and dementia, both, are not a normal part of aging. Neither of them, depression or dementia, is not a normal part of aging. And depression should never, ever be taken lightly. So let's look at what it says here. Unfortunately, depression often goes undiagnosed and untreated in older adults, and they will feel reluctant to seek help. Talk about stigma. At least now, we have some celebrities and some people who play sports who are starting to talk about it, and we're going to look at some in just a minute. But the generation before didn't use the word depression. There was that stigma. There still is. And they may look a little different in an older person. They may have some memory difficulties that's not because of dementia. It's because of depression. We can be in a depression so bad that we're foggy. We've got that brain fog. And look what we've just been through the last couple of years, just as a nation. Depression. We can see personality changes, those physical pains, fatigue. And in men over the age of 75, if they are having suicidal ideations, we need to take that. I mean, we always need to take it very seriously. But it's one of the highest groups of people who not only attempt but complete suicide. Now, I mentioned that we have some, some celebrities who have put their face, they've come forward and have talked about depression. Michael Phelps even, even has a commercial where he talks about his struggle with depression. And let's look at some of these faces here because you might look at these and go, depression, how could that be? That's not the face of depression, is it? The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, Lady Gaga, Michael Phelps is up there. There's Bruce Springsteen. Bruce Springsteen wrote an autobiography where he talks about his, he has been fighting depression his adult life. Right there in the middle, we've got J.K. Rowling. You may not recognize her picture, but you know her work because she's wrote all the Harry Potter books. Terry Bradshaw, anytime you see Terry Bradshaw, he looks just like that. He's laughing and cutting up. 
and he has struggled with depression. Wayne Brady, Jim Carrey, Robin Williams. And I'm guessing on a call with over 200 people on it, there are some of us that could add our picture right up there with theirs. In fact, I've got another program on dementia where I actually have my picture and go up. These are some of the faces, not dementia, depression, of depression. And my face comes up too. Let's start looking at the different types of depression because there are different types. Let's start with this one that's a persistent chronic depressive disorder, dysthymia. This is a depression that lasts for a minimum of two years. And what happens with this is it is a major depression that comes in bouts. And then there's periods of less severe symptoms, but the symptoms are always there. And this can be lifelong. Now, this was just brought to the forefront recently because of the loss of Naomi Judd. And her family came out and she also wrote about in her autobiography, her lifelong battle with depression. But if you look up, because I did it just a few minutes ago, if you look up about Naomi Judd's death, it says lifelong mental illness. What if we worded that a different way? What if we reframed it and said she suffered from a chronic illness or she battled depression? Stigma. Now, here's one you may not have heard of. It's perinatal depression. It's depression during pregnancy. Now, most of us have heard of the next one, the postpartum depression, which is depression after delivery. Perinatal is during pregnancy because of hormone changes, usually. It triggers some changes in the brain, and it can actually start the mother having these extreme, extreme thoughts and worry about the baby's health and safety. And then there's postpartum depression, which is not a normal part of what we call baby blues after someone has a baby. It's extreme sadness, anxiety, exhaustion, to the point that they cannot take care of themselves or take care of the baby. Let's look at major depressive disorder and situational depression because we have heard a lot about these the last couple of years. Now, major depressive disorder has several different names that you may have seen. Clinical depression, chronic depression, severe depression, classic depression, unipolar depression. Now, understand with this, the symptoms last most of the day, every day for at least two weeks. They interfere with our ability to work, sleep, study, and eat. And we can have one episode during our lifetime, or we can have multiple episodes during our lifetime. Many, many, many people over the last two years slipped into a major depressive disorder, especially during 2020 when everything changed. And by the time people were able to get into a doctor, it was much longer than two weeks. Now, there's also situational depression. And situational depression might also be called an adjustment disorder uh, with depressed mood. And that's when we know exactly, typically, we know exactly what caused us to become depressed. And we know that it's situational. Well, I'm depressed because I'm going through a divorce. I'm depressed because I lost my job. I'm depressed because my loved one died. And it's the type of depression that has grief with it. And grief is something that comes in waves. With situational depression, self-esteem is usually maintained. So with this type of depression, we do not typically get um, thoughts of harming oneself. Now, grief and depression absolutely can coexist because depression is part of grief. 
with situational depression, we will get the crying that just comes from nowhere. Where did, where did this come from? I'm walking through the grocery store and I see the food I used to buy for my loved one. I don't have to buy that oatmeal anymore. And we're crying in the grocery store. With situational depression, we may really start having some social withdrawal as we're going through this. Appetite, sleep changes. And then we've got manic depression. Manic depression is part of bipolar disorder. Somebody who has bipolar disorder will have periods of mania or maybe hypomania where it's a little less severe, where they may feel very, very happy. And then it alternates back and forth with episodes of dark, deep depression. So they may go from this very high energy, not sleeping much at all, maybe being kind of irritable with racing thoughts like their mind cannot turn off, even grandiose type thinking, lots of self-esteem and confidence. Keep these in mind because the next slide, we're going to look at some people who have bipolar disorder. They may have hallucinations and delusions. They may do risky behavior. And then we'll turn around and be in a deep, deep, dark depression. For diagnosis, there needs to be an episode of mania that lasts for at least seven days. It can be less if they are hospitalized during that time. And many times they will end up hospitalized throughout their lifetime, sometimes over and over again. And that depressive episode may come before or after the manic episode. They can also have mixed episodes where they're having mania and depression at the same time. Now, of the major depressive disorder, the first one on this page, the latest statistic is that 17.3 million adults in the United States have experienced at least one major depressive disorder. And many of us throughout our lifetime will have, I call them seasons, seasons of depression. So let's look at some of these folks. You may recognize a lot of these. And these are celebrities who've been diagnosed as bipolar, who've talked about it. Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. There's Buzz Aldrin, astronaut. Carrie Fisher, Catherine Zeta-Jones. Demi Lovato has been very, uh, she talks uh, freely about her struggle with being bipolar. Francis Ford Coppola, Frank Sinatra, and Sting. And we said we can get this grandiose, all of this self-confidence. And many times that is when uh, they uh, will feel like they almost are chasing the, or they don't want to stay on any type of medications because that feels fantastic. And I'm productive and I get my best work done. But on the other side of that, what does it look like? There's another type of depression that for some of us, we may be going into this season, seasonal affective disorder. It's also called major depressive disorder with seasonal patterns. And it's where we have an onset of depression, usually during the fall and winter, where there's less natural sunlight. Now, there are people who have spring, summer se seasonal, but for most people, it is a fall, winter disorder. It usually is accompanied by social, with social withdrawal, sleep and weight gain, and it'll return year after year. And you'll see that the lady sitting there has a light in front of her. And that's one of the ways that we treat seasonal affective disorder is with lights, that this particular light is called a happy light. I've got one sitting right here on my desk. It's called a happy light that mimics sunlight and you adjust it and you can have it on for 10 minutes a day. You can adjust the brightness on it. They really do work. There's something to it. Atypical depression is major depressive disorder with an atypical feature. So what this looks like is that they may not seem depressed to other people, but they are right in the middle of a major depressive disorder 
but it's almost like it lifts or it temporarily goes away in response to positive events. So the person is very, very depressed, but maybe when they're at a work function, nobody would ever know because it's like it lifts and then it's back. And then there is premenstrual dysphoric disorder. It's called PMDD, and it is a severe form of premenstrual syndrome, of PMS. It is um, elevated much more than regular PMS, and it's a level of sadness and depression that actually starts to interfere with our day-to-day -day function, and it's related to hormone changes. So what are the risk factors of depression? This is amazing to see that only one-third of those suffering from depression receive treatment. And when you look at and study why is that, it's the stigma. It is, well, I'm embarrassed to talk about it. And then there's lots of shoulds come up. I should be able to. I should if I would only. And people suffer. Healthcare professionals are at a high risk for depression. And they're at a high risk of suicide. In 2020, 31% of all suicides were healthcare workers. Why are healthcare workers, and many of you on here are healthcare workers, why is it that we are afraid to ask for help? Well, we've got all these licenses on the wall and these diplomas on the wall that say that I know what I'm doing. I don't need any help. I'm the one that gives the help. 31% of suicides were healthcare workers in 2020. Let that kind of sink in. When we start talking about dementia in just a little bit, the highest number of folks that have alcohol and drug related dementia, healthcare workers we treat ourselves. Alcohol or prescription medication. We overtreat. Let's look at genetics. 40% of the time there's a family history of depression. And this one is interesting about identical twins. If one twin has a um, depression, has a history of depression, it's about a 70% chance that the other twin will also have depression. Women typically have more depression than men because of hormonal factors. And the statistic is that one third of women at some time in their life will have a major depressive episode. Other things that make us at risk for depression and I think we all fall under this one, environmental, major life changes, continuous exposure to violence, neglect, abuse, or poverty, major life changes. Everyone was affected by the pandemic, still is. But somebody who has grown up with trauma, more prone to depression. That's under psychological factors, personality, Physical illness, a person who has a diagnosis, especially a new diagnosis, or they get a diagnosis of a chronic illness. And then there are some medication interactions that can actually cause depression. So we've got to be careful about that. So the way that depression shows up in women, many times women will appear to be sad. They may have feelings of being worthless. And women also will carry a lot of guilt. In men, the way we see depression is typically anger, irritability, and fatigue, or being very lethargic, being tired all the time. And please hear and understand that even when there's no obvious reason for depression, you can still have it. You can still be depressed. So how do we get diagnosed? Those symptoms are there for two weeks, at least two weeks, 
now in the short video we're going to watch in just a minute, they say one week, but I pulled my handy dandy DSM-5 two weeks. We do want to start with the primary care physician. And what's the primary care physician going to do? They are going to do that diagnostic exam. They're going to do an in-depth interview with us, a physical exam, and then a lab test to rule out other health conditions because there are health conditions that can cause depression. Thyroid issues, vitamin deficiencies can mimic depression, and we can treat those. Also going to look at medical and family histories as well. Now, at the psychiatrist, they will do all of the things that that primary care physician does, but a psychiatrist specializes in mental health. They can also perform therapy or they may recommend a therapist. Many times the psychiatrist will be the one to do the diagnosis, do the medication, and then they'll send you to somebody like me, a licensed professional counselor, a licensed clinical social worker. Some licensed master social workers do some counseling, or they may you may end up at a um, psychologist as well who can do an in-depth psychological testing. But I also want you to make sure that you see this. I put it in bold and underlined it. All depression can be treated I didn't say it could all be cured, but look how many times we can cure it. 80 to 90% of the time, we can cure dep depression. And even if we can't cure it, you can see a reduction in symptoms 100% of the time. We can reduce some of the symptoms, if not all. And we'll look at ways to do that. But the earlier we start treatment, the more effective it's going to be. But we've got to be able to recognize it in ourselves and recognize it in others and then ask for help. No two people are going to be affected the same way by depression, just like with dementia. I could be depressed. Jamie could be depressed. Marty could be depressed. We and all of us look completely different. Our depression doesn't look the same. Even if we all went through the same event, it wouldn't necessarily look the same. So the treatment isn't a one-size-fits-all. And it takes time. It takes trial and error. But what happens when we're really, really depressed is we want a quick fix. We want it fixed right now. I don't have time. But with depression, you cannot simply, I'm going to tough this out without doing some damage to yourself. Some of the ways that we treat depression, medication, so antidepressants. And I've got a chart on here. And again, you're getting copies of these so you can look at it a little closer. I know that's hard to see on the screen. Antidepressants are not habit forming and they are not uppers. They are not something that you take and you're going to feel high with an antidepressant. They can take up to two to four weeks to work, sometimes two to three months. However, some of the symptoms will start to improve much, much sooner than that. So there may still be that depressed feeling, but you're sleeping better. There may still be a depressed feeling, but your appetite has changed. Your concentration begins to improve. So it is slowly working. Most of the time, we do recommend an antidepressant for at least six months before coming off because I'll have people start feeling really, really good and go, I'm feeling great. I'm not, I'm going to stop taking my, well, why are you feeling great? Think about why you're feeling great. Another thing that we do is going for therapy, going for counseling, and it may be called psychotherapy, talk therapy, or counseling. Probably the most common type of counseling that we see is cognitive behavior therapy. And that's where we focus on problem solving, or you may see hear that word reframing, how we're going to reframe what's happening. Some of the things that happens in CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, is it helps us recognize that distorted thinking or negative thinking that we may be having. The goal is to change our thoughts and behaviors so we respond to the challenges in our life in a more positive way. 
There's many, many, many different types of therapies. These are just some of the most common. Interpersonal therapy, where you're going to focus on relationships with others, and it usually lasts between 12 and 16 weeks. Problem-solving therapy, where it's designed to specifically work on and help manage maybe a negative stressful event that's going on in your life. But there are many different types of therapy. But some other interventions for depression. And again, you may see exercise. When I'm depressed, I don't feel like exercising. But that is where we might want to really push ourselves because there is a therapy called um, dialectical behavior therapy, where one of the things that we try to do is I don't feel like getting out of bed. I want to stay in the bed. I'm just going to stay in here. So you do an opposite action. Okay, I'm going to get up and go take a walk. And if at the end of that walk, when I get back, I still want to get back in the bed, I'll allow myself to do that. Because most of the time we don't. We'll go ahead and take the walk. We'll get out in the sunshine. We'll get the dog. We'll do. And so it's doing the opposite action of what we're feeling. Making sure that we have somebody that we can talk to, that we trust, that doesn't try to fix it. Because sometimes the person with depression just needs to be heard. We have to set gradual goals and not immediate goals. And another thing we can do is educate ourselves about depression. What we don't want to do is try to fill that empty void with alcohol, drugs, porn, shopping, food, gambling. That's what we tend to want to do. I've got an empty space. I'm going to fill it. And we're not working through the depression. So how can I help someone who's depressed? Be that ear. Listen, understanding, patience, support, and encouragement. Don't ever, ever ignore somebody's comments about suicide. Invite them to do things to get out of their element a little bit. I'll do it with you. Let's go on a walk. Let's go to eat. Let's go get some coffee. Let's take a drive so that we're getting out. Making sure they have that transportation back and forth to appointments. You might offer to take them back and forth to their therapy or their counseling. Because after you've done, let's say they're going through EMDR, it's very hard to drive yourself back from an appointment whenever you've had a therapy session like that. And then reminding them that you're going to be right there with them. You're going to walk through this with them. And that time, time and treatment that this depression is going to lift even though it feels like it's not going to in the moment. I've got a short video that is a summary of depression. There it is. I thought it wasn't going to pop up for a minute. So let's just watch this real quick. It's going to summarize what we just talked about. Depression is a disorder that afflicts over 10% of the world's population, but we as a society know little about it. Stereotypes tell us that depressed people are weak, unless they happen to be a tortured artist. It can be difficult to understand depression because it's invisible. It's a disorder defined by thoughts, behaviors, and feelings, rather than obvious symptoms like vomiting, rashes, or fever. Those who have experienced depression are all too familiar with comments from misguided friends such as snap out of it or just get up and do something. Even those with depression might have a hard time understanding what they are experiencing, and they often blame themselves for not being able to snap out of it. To understand what depression really is, we need to talk about symptoms. First of all, depression has symptoms related to how someone feels. These symptoms include nearly constant feelings of sadness, anger, guilt, or hopelessness. Next, there are symptoms related to behavior. They include social withdrawal, a lack of energy, low motivation, poor concentration, sleep problems, or significant changes in appetite. Finally, symptoms related to thoughts include poor self-esteem, thoughts of suicide, 
and loss of interest in regular activities. Symptoms of depression must last at least one week, and they are often cyclical. This means that the symptoms can come and go over a period of months or years. A person who experiences depression once is likely to have future episodes. It can be difficult to think of these thoughts, feelings, and behaviors as symptoms. To many of us, because they're in our head, they can seem like decisions. It can seem like someone who is depressed has chosen to be lazy and sleep all day, or they have decided to stop spending time with friends because they have a bad attitude. But remember, what's in our head isn't imaginary. Our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are influenced by a complex series of chemicals in our brains. The exact causes of depression are poorly understood, but we have an idea of factors that influence the illness. We know that changes to hormones in the brain, called neurotransmitters, can have a major effect on depression. Many medications used in the treatment of depression work by increasing the levels of these neurotransmitters. We also know that genetics play an important role in depression. People who have a family history of depression are more likely to experience the disorder. Just because your parents had depression doesn't mean you necessarily will, but the chances are greater. Finally, we know that environmental factors play a role in depression. Living in poverty, experiencing a traumatic event, or other stressful situations may trigger the disorder. That being said, depression does not always have a clear trigger, which often leads to a person not understanding why they feel so down. Treatment for depression usually includes psychotherapy and medication. Either can work on its own, but a combination of both medication and therapy has been found to be the most effective. In summary, depression is a disorder that's widespread, but poorly understood. The symptoms can negatively affect a person's thoughts, feelings, and behavior to a debilitating degree. However, treatments that include medication, psychotherapy, or a combination of the two can help to manage to eliminate the symptoms of depression. And one of the things that she mentioned there was um, after a virus and post-COVID depression is a very real thing. We know that now. There's people who had COVID and then are for months later had post-COVID depression, just like a post-COVID brain fog. We've heard of that. Here's some information where you can go for help with depression. And so let's start to kind of segue over into depression and dementia. There is now research that shows that if someone has untreated, untreated depression, there is actual permanent damage that can take place to the brain. And it's due to the chemical changes. You're looking at a um, picture here that shows depression changes brain metabolism and blood flow in the frontal cortex. There's chemical changes that occur within the hippocampus, and that is the memory center of the brain. Another area that gets damaged by depression, again, untreated depression, is that part of the brain that has conflict resolution. That center of the brain, that prefrontal cortex, which is associated with planning and executive function, So when we start doing an admission on somebody who has dementia, many times as we're doing kind of a background or a history on them, and I'll hear, oh, they've had depression forever. They've, been, they've had depression since that. Was it treated? Were they doing anything about it? And just so many times the answer is no. And now we know we have proof that it's changing the brain. So let's switch gears and start talking about dementia. So again, when you think of the word dementia, what's the first word that comes to your mind? Um, let me have everybody kind of put that in the chat as well. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word dementia? And there people are putting in memory, uh, caregiver fatigue, they're old, memory loss, memory loss, memory loss, memory loss, memory loss, memory loss, memory loss. <laughs> so usually, even whenever I'm talking to professionals, if I talk about, tell me, start talking about dementia. Memory, they forget, they can't remember. 
those are all the same thing. There's over 35 common symptoms with dementia. And that is one of the reasons we do what we do is to get out and educate family members and educate professionals on what exactly is dementia. Because dementia, the word dementia does not mean memory loss. Dementia indicates problems with at least two brain functions. Because a person could have memory loss caused from something else that can be treated. It may be a thyroid disorder. It may be malnutrition. It may be a vitamin deficiency. It may be depression. And we treat it and the memory loss goes away. But if we have memory loss and impaired judgment, or we have memory loss and impaired language, we need to start looking a little further into this. Dementia, as I said earlier, can present with no memory loss. There's a couple of different types of dementia that can present with no memory loss. We're gonna look at them in just a minute. And please see in red, this is not a normal part of aging. Memory loss is not a normal part of aging. It's also not contagious. Slowing down is a normal part of aging. There's study after study after study that we could take people without dementia and give them a same type memory test that we give a group of college students and they're gonna make the same score on it, but it's gonna take them longer to take the test. And they're not gonna be on their phone talking and driving and do at the same time because they're not going to be able to multitask as well. Dementia signs and symptoms. Now some of you mentioned a few different things other than memory loss, confusion, but hallucinations, delusions, inappropriate sexual behavior, that loss of inhibition, being verbally aggressive, crying or tearful, paranoia, destroying property. So many times, once a family's getting ready to place their loved one, we'll look back over a list like this and they'll say things like, oh, they've been doing that for years. I had no idea. They did start doing that. They were, and they realize it's been happening. They just thought that dementia was memory loss. Dementia is an umbrella term. Dementia is this, that umbrella term that describes a range of symptoms associated with cognitive impairment. Number one question we get asked, what's the difference in Alzheimer's and dementia? Alzheimer's is the most common type, form, cause of dementia. That's why you hear more of it about it. Some statistics show that up to, actually you can find some statistics that say up to 80% of all dementias is Alzheimer's disease. We usually will say about 60-70%. But there's also vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, Parkinson's disease dementia. There's over 130 different types of dementia. And they all fall under that umbrella that the, the one we hear the most about because there's more of it is Alzheimer's disease. So the statement, my loved one has dementia, but they don't have Alzheimer's could be true because maybe they have vascular. But the statement, my loved one has Alzheimer's, but they don't have dementia, that's not true. They have the most common type, form, or cause of dementia. So many times whenever we are looking at statistics or we're looking at data, it will just say Alzheimer's disease when they're talking about dementia, when they're talking about dementia as a whole. I do want us to look at, this is a three minute video, and it is one of the best ways to describe what is going on in the brain of someone who has dementia. A person who has dementia, their brain is dying. Their brain is failing. 
Now those different diseases, Alzheimer's disease, vascular, Lewy body, frontotemporal, that is going to change the way that the brain atrophies or changes or dies. But the brain is dying. The brain is failing in everyone who has dementia. And this video makes it pretty simple to understand. What is Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's is a slow, fatal disease of the brain affecting one in 10 people over the age of 65. No one is immune. The disease comes on gradually as two abnormal protein fragments called plaques and tangles accumulate in the brain and kill brain cells. They start here in the hippocampus, the part of the brain where memories are first formed. Over many years time, the plaques and tangles slowly destroy the hippocampus and it becomes harder and harder to form new memories. Simple recollections from a few hours or days ago that the rest of us might take for granted are just not there. After that, more plaques and tangles spread into different regions of the brain, killing cells and compromising function wherever they go. This spreading around is what causes the different stages of Alzheimer's. From the hippocampus, the disease spreads here to the region of the brain where language is processed. And when that happens, it gets tougher and tougher to find the right word. Next, the disease creeps toward the front of the brain where logical thought takes place. Very gradually, a person begins to lose the ability to solve problems, grasp concepts, and make plans. Next, the plaques and tangles invade the part of the brain where emotions are regulated. When this happens, the patient gradually loses control over moods and feelings. After that, the disease moves to where the brain makes sense of things it sees, hears, and smells. In this stage, Alzheimer's wreaks havoc on a person's senses and can spark hallucinations. Eventually, the plaques and tangles erase a person's oldest and most precious memories, which are stored here in the back of the brain. Near the end, the disease compromises a person's balance and coordination. And in the very last stage, it destroys the part of the brain that regulates breathing and the heart. The progression from mild forgetting to death is slow and steady and takes place over an average of eight to ten years. It is relentless and, for now, incurable. Helping your family, friends, and neighbors to better understand Alzheimer's will reduce stigma, improve care, and even help the fight for a cure. Thanks for helping to do your part. Learn more at www.aboutalz.org. You might have recognized that voice. That was David Hyde Pierce. He was Niles on Frasier. He is a big supporter of the Alzheimer's Association because dementia is something that is in his family. So we're just going to review four of the most common types of dementia that we tend to see over and over and over again, but there are over 130 different types of dementia. That video was talking specifically about Alzheimer's disease with the plaque and the tangles that are on the brain. And we do have some specific programs. We've got programs that are just about Alzheimer's, just about vascular, um, that you can find on our uh, YouTube channel if you're interested in looking for those. Uh, or you can contact Jamie or myself and we can get you that information. But the most common type of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. Uh, that With Alzheimer's disease, we're having this continuous decline in thinking. They will hit a plateau with most dementias. They'll kind of hit a plateau and then they'll just start to decline. They'll hit that plateau and start to decline. It's the fourth leading cause of death in people over the age of 65 in the United States. Of the top 10 causes of death, it is the least funded. The least funded of the top 10. 
Vascular dementia is exactly what it sounds like. When you hear that word vascular, you probably thought of the word cardiovascular. So anything that is bad for the heart is bad for the brain. This is about 20% of all dementias. And it's ex exactly, again, like I said, anything that causes a, a disruption or an interruption in circulation of the blood, the most common cause of vascular dementia is TIAs or very small strokes. This is the one dementia that can have a sudden onset. It can also be people who have uncontrolled high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, heart issues, smokers are at a high risk for vascular dementia. Uh, the thing with vascular dementia is that the personality and the emotions tend to stay intact for a very long time. Their judgment is not usually affected until much later in the disease. Now, vascular dementia is one where they can be on a plateau and have a sudden change because they have a TIA or they have another stroke. So vascular is one of the very few that comes on suddenly. Now, many times families will say something like, my parent, my spouse was fine until they went in and they had surgery and they came out from under anesthesia and they had dementia. Well, anesthesia is the number one accelerator of the disease, but that disease was already there. And so if we go and we look at all of those symptoms, the families typically can look back and go, well, they were doing that before the surgery. Yeah, they were doing that. They were doing that. But general anesthesia, I'm not talking about twilight, general anesthesia where the person is intubated is the number one accelerator of the disease. So we want to try to avoid that as much as we can. Lewy body dementia. This is where some abnormal structures actually grow on the brain and they're called Lewy bodies. They're on the outer cortex of the brain and the average onset uh, age is in a person's 60s. This typically starts with mobility issues and a lot of falls and hallucinations. So it sounds like Parkinson's. Treatment is difficult with Lewy body. It's hard to get a good diagnosis because many times they may even get misdiagnosed as Parkinson's for a long time. But with a person with Lewy body dementia, if we treat them with Parkinson's medications, it actually makes them much worse. So if we give them the medications for hallucinations that you give someone with Parkinson's, it makes that tremor and the mobility issues worse. If we treat the falls and the mobility issues, it makes the hallucinations worse. So it's hard to treat. And then frontotemporal dementias, frontotemporal disorders is an umbrella all by itself underneath the dementia umbrella. But we're just going to talk specifically about frontotemporal dementia. Sometimes it's called FTD. And look at how this starts. It starts with personality changes first. So they may do things like inappropriate behaviors in public. They may have a flat affect or apathy. And it will present as an emotional or a mental disorder, and they may get misdiagnosed as well. It can sometimes take a very long time to get a proper diagnosis for frontotemporal dementia. And look at the ages. This typically starts in younger people between the ages of 30 and 65. Now, some of you, when I ask, tell me what you know about dementia, you were putting old, old age, elderly. 30 to 65. This one does have a strong family history about 50% of the time. It is um, in a family and it's four times more common in men. Let's look at some other risk factors for dementia. About 58% of the time it is the, per it's the person's age. So getting older that does up our chances for dementia. 30% of the time Generally, it's genetics. We've already talked about smoking, obesity, um, alcohol use, being female. And we can look at that. Females do tend to live longer than males. Uh, the new um, life expectancy charts just came out in August. New ones come out every August. And we dropped. We dropped pretty dramatically. Right now in the United States, life expectancy for a male is 76. 
life expectancy for a female is 81. So if we have someone get diagnosed at a male who gets diagnosed at 80, they're already four years past life expectancy. So the chances of them living up to 10 years with the disease are not very high because they're already past a normal life expectancy. Somebody who has the diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment, about 40% of those people, it's going to become dementia within three years. Notice depression is on that list as well, as is head injury and traumatic brain, uh, traumatic brain injury. So how do we get diagnosed with dementia? We start with that primary care physician again. They need to do an in-depth interview of the patient and of that care partner. They're going to do a medical and a family history. They need to do a medication review to make sure that this memory loss isn't just because we have some medications interacting. A physical exam, a mental status exam, and a lot of lab work. Because again, we want to try to rule out anything that we could treat. They may also order some imaging tests. Now, they may send you to that neurologist or geriatrician, or you may choose to go to the neurologist or geriatrician on your own, and they can do all the same things that the primary care physician does, but they specialize in the field. So they're going to be able to order some additional tests. They may do something like a lumbar puncture to look for proteins in the spinal fluid or to rule out other symptoms. They may also order an MRI, a CT, a PET scan, or an EEG. You may also end up at the neuropsychologist where they do some testing. They test orientation, memory, attention, verbal and written commands, and other cognitive abilities. And you may end up at all three of these. So what's the treatment or therapy for dementia? Because there is no cure for any of those over 130 different dementias. There is no cure right now. The only medicines we have are to treat symptoms. Now, you may hear them called memory meds, but they aren't treating the disease. They aren't treating the dementia. They're treating the symptoms of the dementia. Anybody who has dementia is what we call palliative care. Palliative care is where we want to improve a person's quality of life because they have a terminal illness. This is a terminal illness. And palliative care focuses on the body, the mind, and the spirit. We have to shift gears when there's a dementia diagnosis, and we shift away from curative to comfort because we can't cure it. But we can do things to provide comfort and still have quality of life. Support and counseling for the patient as well as that care partner. Now, I mentioned medication, and again, you're getting these slides. So this is just some of the medications that are used to treat different symptoms. There's medications on there to treat confusion. There's medications on here to treat anxiety, depression, hallucinations and delusions. There's medication to treat aggression, hostility, even being uncooperative and agitation. There's medications that stimulate appetite because at some point, most people with dementia are going to stop eating. And they may stop eating because they don't know to eat or they don't remember to eat. Now, eventually they're gonna stop eating because they're at the end of their life. And a person with dementia, this is, sentence is so important. A person with dementia does not die because they stop eating. A person with dementia stops eating because they are dying. Please hear that. A person with dementia doesn't die because they stop eating. They stop eating because they're dying. The part of the brain that tells that food to metabolize is gone. And even if we force, if we put in a feeding tube, if the digestive system isn't working anymore and the brain isn't telling it to digest and to metabolize, we're actually causing pain. We're causing discomfort. There's medications on here to treat anxiety and restlessness as well. 
Some of the other things we do to treat dementia is a person with dementia is going to go in and out of therapy, and we want to make sure and know when to ask for that therapy. Physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. Because those therapists, you get a good team of therapists who are trained in memory care, in dementia care, and make sure and ask that they are trained in this. Otherwise, you're going to get a therapist putting their non-compliant and they're going to their next client. So you've got to get a company that has um, folks that are trained in memory care. They know how to tap into muscle memory. They can tap into that long ago muscle memory, and you want to talk about quality of life. We have a therapy team here at the West Center, and all of the residents will go in and out of these therapies, starting with physical therapy. This is going to help reduce their fall risk because eventually a person with dementia is going to have falls. They have not always been walking. They're going to back back, back, back to what they originally were, and we were not always walking. We weren't always talking. We weren't always feeding ourselves. We weren't always um, being able to take ourselves to the bathroom, and we weren't always talking. So they will have falls as they stop walking, just like we had falls as we learned to walk. But physical therapy can help them with muscle tone, flexibility, strength, balance, mobility, and then occupational therapy. You may not even be familiar with occupational therapy, but look at all the different things that occupational therapy can help with. Strength and endurance. It helps them maintain the ability to do practical everyday things like to feed themselves and to be able to dress themselves. Dignity. Independence. It may be them coming and showing you at home, we need some grab bars, we need a bath chair. Let me introduce you to an adaptive eating utensil and all kinds of other modifications that you can make in the home to keep them at home longer. Speech therapy, we talked about this today in another program that I did. A person with dementia may start to, <coughs> <coughs> while they're eating or drinking, like they're trying to clear their throat. Again, we talked about the brain is dying. It's going from a three pound brain down to a one pound brain. We've got a little flap here in our throat that tells that's food, that's water, that's air, and it's controlled by the brain. And there's gonna come a time that they start to aspirate. You get a speech therapy consult, they come in and they do a swallow study, and they may do something like change their diet or change the liquid or the thickness of a liquid. You know, it sounds like it makes sense that it would be easier to swallow something very thin like water, but actually it's easier to swallow something that's thicker. And they may teach you or they may uh, change their diet to a nectar thick or a honey thick liquid. And then I've also put on here music therapy because we see the difference music therapy makes every day. We have a master's level music therapist here on staff at the West Center and music, that part of the brain on the right side of the brain remains, that right rhythmic side of the brain remains. And so music stays. Music can be used as a mood stabilizer. It helps us connect with each other. It allows us to have those social interactions. It also will get people to do things like dance and exercise, even in people who've never done it before. Other interventions, we're treating dementia right now by having this program and you being in this class because education is one of the ways that we treat dementia. We want to make sure and always be monitoring the person's comfort. We check for pain first. If somebody is having uh, some type of a challenging behavior, or we like to call those expressions a challenging expression, behavior sounds very negative. What's going on? Are they in some type of pain? Are they hungry? Are they thirsty? Do they need to go to the bathroom? But they don't have the words left to be able to tell us. They're doing the best they can with what they have left. 
And the four things that we use for redirection, number one, food, the sweeter, the better. Their tastes are changing, but sweet remains in almost everybody. So ice cream, God's gift to dementia. Music, their music, probably not your music, their music. Everyone has a music set from the age of 10 to 25. We develop what's called our music set. So we want to find out what music is from their youth or their teenage years. Animals and children. And if you don't have real animals or you don't have children around, go to YouTube and type in funny animal videos, children laughing videos, and get some ice cream and you're set. It's a great way to distract. So what can I do to help someone with dementia? One of the things we want to do is make sure that we stay connected. Stay connected to that person with dementia. Make sure you're continuing to build your own skills and educating yourself about the disease. I've been doing this a long, long time. And I stay with these families all the way till the end of the disease and sit with them bedside as their loved one is passing. And the more educated a family is, they know what's happening. They don't have as many questions. They're not as confused and they're not as scared if they've educated themselves about this. Focus on quality of life. Remember, we have to shift from curative to comfort. There is no cure, but let's have quality of life. Being flexible and go to their world. They can't come to ours. And remember, a person with dementia is never, ever giving you a hard time. They're having a hard time. These are some places here locally that you can go for help. But even if you are someplace else or if you are in another state, I know for certain that you can contact your local Alzheimer's Association. And that 800 number is their number that you can call and it will direct you to your local office. We have Dementia Friendly Fort Worth, our North Central Texas Area Agency on Aging, and us here at the West Center, and you can contact us no matter where you are. And then Jamie is going to hop back on and go over some other resources. Yes, thank you, Holly. I want to point out just to highlight um, or highlight some of the resources. Um, this PEARLS program that's listed right here on top is very um, appropriate because this is a program for people that are 60 and older and who have feelings of sadness or that they just don't have anything that they enjoy anymore. It's a four to six month program that you walk through with a um, trained professional um, to help you to really start to enjoy to do uh, or start enjoying the things that you used to or maybe finding um, some things that you might not think you enjoy. Um, a really great program, and well, I want to highlight that. Of course, the Texans Recovering Together is healthy dealing with COVID-related stress. Holly mentioned that um, and how that might be impacting us in a variety of ways. And then there's the Wellness Center for Older Adults. Um, I know there's a lot of people from different areas um, here on the call today. These are mostly specific to our North Central Texas area, um, but if you'll flip to the next slide, We'll go over some other ones. And these are really to support people with dementia. Of course, the Area Agency on Aging. And the Area Agency on Aging, this is a nationwide um, initiative. So we do have local agencies, um, of course, throughout our state, but also throughout the nation. So if you're looking for resources, whether you're a family or friend caregiver or professional, please reach out um, to your local AAA or Area Agency on Aging because each one of them has a variety of resources they can offer, um, whether it's general support, they can help with benefits counseling. They can help with support with people with dementia or people living with chronic illness and their caregivers as well. There's also the Aging and Disability Resource Center, and Holly had mentioned already, um, to call. They can help with really in-home stuff. Maybe it's housekeeping. Maybe it's some personal care and do some respite for you all. Meals on Wheels. Meals on Wheels is a national program as well. And these are for, they can do home delivered meals for people that are homebound, not able to get out anymore. Um, and then some Meals on Wheels organizations do some congregate meals as well. So if you're going to a community center or a senior center, they may be delivering meals there that a person can pick up and take home with them. And they have um, their meals meet high nutrition um, and uh, they offer a lot of other programs as well. So they might have some programs to help with pets. They may help with home medications, um, but also some of them can help with home um, uh, like um not um, renovated products, but if renovation product, um, 
situations, but if you need like grab bars installed um, or a wheelchair ramp or something like that in the home, they can help. Of course, there's the Alzheimer's Association um, and they offer a lot of virtual programs that you can pop on at any time, but there's also um, local programs they can do in support groups. And there is a um, REACH program that the Alzheimer's Association does. It might be on the next slide, um, but this is more one-on-one -on -one support for um, a trained professional and somebody that might be caregiving for somebody with support. They walk with you for several months and do some one-on-one -on -one counseling and education. And Dementia Friendly Fort Worth, Holly had mentioned earlier, they offer a variety of programs um, for the person with dementia, but also caregivers and professionals as well. Um, uh, the third bullet point here, WellMed, this is a teleconnect um, program. So it's you listen on the phone um, to the program. You can listen live. They offer so many different topics and programs throughout the month. If you don't catch the program live, that's okay because they record those and you can um, listen to the recording of that at a later date. Of course, the West Center, um, you have just went through a program with us today, but we also offer a variety of other evidence-informed programs, programs we can provide CE credits and support groups as well. Holly does um, facilitate our support groups that we offer weekly and um, we have some weekly and some monthly as well. And of course, there are the Adult Protective Services. Um, this is somebody is suspected of abuse or there's some neglect or maybe somebody's living alone um, and they have, you know, they have dementia or they're having some cognitive abilities and there's nobody else there to support them. And we might need to call Adult Protective Services to help step in and fill in the gaps where that might be needed. Um, our uh, Area Agency on Aging or the North Texas Council of Governments offers a variety of programs. They just got um, a grant through um, ACL, a government grant, and pull up these. So sorry, my computer froze. Different programs. I just want to point out a couple of more here that um, we're offering in this area, if I can find it. So there are several programs that they can do, whether it's referrals to other resources in your area. So if you're calling about something, um, you would maybe talk to a caregiver information specialist and tell them, hey, here's what's going on. Here's where I need help. Here's what's missing. Do you have something about X, Y, or Z? And they can really point you in the right direction because they have all the resources right there. Um, they are, we are fortunate enough to live in an area that offers a ton of resources. And it's hard to navigate some of those as well and um, figure out what you need, but you can call this individual um, and they can help you figure out all those resources, whether it might be you need um, meals delivered, you might need support group, you might be suppressive care, or you just might need some additional education. Um, they're there to help with that. And I believe that is the last slide on those. Like Holly mentioned, you'll get a copy of all these things. So you have the numbers. If you're frantically jotting those down, you have the numbers for each one of those resources. Um, and they also have a really great website too that you can click on and it gives you much more extensive information about each one of those programs. I have, I have put in the chat once again, the link to download the slides um, for, um, from today's presentation. You will also get those in a follow-up email, but I want to add, yes, we are very blessed. And as you can see by today, the James L. West Center is probably one of the greatest assets we have in our community that we're very, very blessed to have um, here. Um, and, and also I want to point out that we're going to be doing uh, the grant that um, that Jamie um, talked about is the dementia friendly North Central and East Texas um, that we're going to be rolling out in a webinar um, next month on the 27th, a, a, a month from today, we're gonna be doing a presentation on, on that and what's available in the communities that that um, grant serves. So I'll throw that in and you'll you'll have that flyer when you get your email, follow up email. Jamie, do you wanna go, go over the, um, the CEUs real quick? Absolutely, yeah, you will receive a follow up email um, from this program. And in that email, there will be a link for a survey monkey evaluation. We do ask that everybody complete the evaluation so we can get some great feedback on our program. Um, but if you're seeking a C credit, we're offering one and a half hours for um, social work, nurses, LPCs, and a certificate of attendance as well. You are required to complete that evaluation and it must be completed by the end of the day on October 4th when the evaluation closes. Please allow about three to four weeks for us to process all the CE credits and get those certificates um, emailed back out to each one of you. I want to point out that there was, thanks, Jamie. I want to point out that there was a little bit of confusion about the Survey Monkey. 
please understand that when you're um, attending webinars that we're putting on, the, the CEU um, requirements are webinar specific. So um, they're not the same for every webinar we do, uh, same as the number of hours and the CEUs that are being offered are different by um, webinar that we um, present. So the Survey Monkey is based is only related to the webinars we do with the James I. West Center because they're gracious enough to provide the CEUs and they're able to provide more CEUs for uh, licensed nurses um, that we're not set up to provide for. So please pay it. So you got to really pay attention to the CEU uh, information on these webinars. But in addition to Jamie's information, the Google survey should pop up at the end of the, um, or as you close out today, that is for us, the North Central Texas Area Agency on Aging. And that helps us to track and, and report back on the fun, on the objectives we set forth when we applied for the funding to put on these webinars. Now, I guess we'll go back to Holly. Did you have any questions that you wanted to answer or touch on? Well, um, let me look and see. I'm sorry. Somebody has asked, oh, it said, when should we receive the survey monkey? Um, in the follow-up email, it will either be this afternoon or tomorrow morning. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, and somebody had talked about hearing the term nervous breakdown years ago. What was that? Uh, and many times whenever you, if you look up or what was a nervous break, and people will still use that, you know, that's one of those terms we don't use is like we don't use the term crazy. We don't use those type of terms anymore. But a nervous breakdown, many times with somebody, if you looked into it, that was depression. That was major depression uh, where they got to the point that they either were maybe suicidal um, or maybe where they wanted to harm someone else, uh, or they just got to the point that they didn't want to exist anymore and they would go get in the bed and I'm just not going to get out of the bed or I can't function. That's usually what we look at is, is the person able to function day to day? It's just a term that we don't use, um, but people most definitely still are hospitalized for depression. Uh, and it's one of those things that we don't, need to be afraid of so that we don't and that we start treating it earlier so that we don't get to that point. Uh, let's see, dementia is the fourth leading cause of death but receives no funding out of the top 10. I can't recall what exactly was said about this. Could you repeat? Yes. So it's the fourth leading cause of death in people over the age of 65. But if you look at the top 10 reasons that people over the age of 65 pass away, it's the least funded of the top 10. So all of those others have more funding going toward them than dementia research does. De Debbie Austin, I know you put your hand up. Um, we're not going to be calling on anybody. We don't open up the, the, um, the mic per se on these webinars because there's so many people. But if you have a question, please put it in the, what, in the, um, in the chat. I, 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 know I see that you talked about the nervous breakdown, but if you have anything else, put it in the chat or Q&A, please. And Holly, there was a question if there's any information or research on SPEC scans for dementia or brain health diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Do you have an update on that? Yeah, there actually, I mean, there is, if that is something that you have had done or, but that is one of those scans. Where we get into with all of these scans is so many times insurance won't pay for it. And that has been a fight that neurologists and other professionals have been fighting Medicare won't pay for it. And then when you get into the nitty gritty and find out why, uh, their reasoning is if there's not a cure, if there's not a treatment, then why would we pay for you to do an $8,000 test just to find out you have it? That's the logic that they use. Um, why would we pay for this test to find out you have a disease that there's no treatment for? Well, what if we found out we had the disease and we could maybe have groups of people do research or have, don't get me going on that high horse, uh, but that is one of those, uh, many times you may have to pay out of pocket or if you happen to get insurance to pay for it, yes, that's another uh, way that they can diagnose. 
And another person asked earlier on, I know we don't probably want to hear, get every question, but somebody asked, is there a um, link between trauma and dementia? You yes, mind? absolutely. There's a link between trauma and dementia. And we are seeing more and more. It's just like that link between depression and dementia. Whenever we have undergone trauma, especially if we uh, went through trauma, there are some research right now. I, I went through a program very recently about trauma before the age of five whenever that brain is still developing. And if that little brain uh, is already starting to dump a lot of cortisol and the chemicals, and the, it changes the way that the brain forms. Mm -hmm. And then down the road so many times, they also are at a very, very high risk of um, emotional trauma, yes, uh, and physical trauma. But emotional trauma is, is especially what I'm talking about. Yes, ECT is still used for treatment of resistant depression. Um, and so it will change how the brain forms. And then those folks are also, those children become at very, very high risk of becoming um, addicts, alcoholics, because they're trying to learn to deal with the feelings and emotions they're having. That then adds to the um, risk of having dementia. Well, very good. We are running up against right our time. time. Yep. It's one thirty-one, so I want to make sure we get... Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Holly and Jamie. As you can see with the comments, impressive 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 thank you so much um thank you all for joining us look out for the follow-up